Hi everyone, Adrian from Audio Excellence Canada, Philip, Angus, and Alex behind the cameras. Hope you're all doing well. So uh, we're going to do a, a video about audiophiles or music lovers or both. So this is something that um, I'll just tell you the catalyst about how I, I decided to, why I decided to do this um, video topic. Partly because we ran out of stuff to unbox. That's not true. We actually have a whole bunch of stuff to unbox. But I figured you guys are probably sick of watching us unbox stuff, and I'm actually sick of doing it. Um, but there's actually um, a reason for this. Actually, two. I recently got an email from a viewer who got really upset with us. Well, I wouldn't say upset, but not happy. Uh, maybe upset. I rate. I rate. Yeah. He said, why do you guys like Macintosh and Tubes so much? Quote, any decent solid state amp is faster, more transparent, more detailed, no maintenance, and went on and on and on. And he said, Tubes sound slow, sluggish, um, uh, colored. And then he listed eight albums, for example, that, that he uses uh, all the time. So um, he owns eight albums, doesn't no, he? No, no, he used eight, eight, eight albums as an example. You know there are audiophiles who own eight albums or five albums. That's so, the actual... So when I looked at the eight and then I thought, oh my God. Any of them the, rush? The, the Any one, of them rush? The one common thing was that they were all audiophile approved labels or recordings. For example, Sheffield's Labs drum record. Brian Bromberg. Because, because right? I love listening to drums all the yeah, time. Yeah, Brian Bromberg, right? All bass. Nils Lofgren. If I never heard Nils Lofgren ever again, it would be too soon. And and to be fair, let me just say, for those of you, by the way, who've um, been so generous and, and donated money to your favorite charity and asked us for our playlist, which, by the way, you can still do. And I, this is not meant to be a um, a, a commercial. We, we, we truly want, as a community, to give back to people who are less fortunate. So this is why we do this. If you want my playlist uh, on Tidal, donate $10 to your favorite charity. Take a picture of it, send it to info at audioexcellence.ca and I'd be happy to send you the playlist. Philips is $20. Um, and in my playlist, you will see audiophile approved recordings. A part of that is because they are well recorded and I need them to be used as sort of a, a judge, if you will, or a reference point. But you'll also notice in the uh, playlist, there's all kinds of stuff that's not anywhere near audiophile uh, uh, approved yeah, recordings. Yeah, you got weird taste. Yeah, but, but it, 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 it's... You it's, listen it's, to Bananarama. Yeah, no, exactly. He, Who, hey, you shouldn't, you what <laughs> do you know, Mr. <laughs> Nuja Babe guy? <laughs> so... The, the point is that, uh, anyway, we'll get to that point. Um, then the other catalyst, um, so I, I've i mentioned to the guys, I think, but I certainly have mentioned to a couple of other clients that I've I've had a great time watching uh, this channel called Jay's Audio Lab. I don't know if you guys are familiar. It's a big, muscular gentleman, looks like he's in Florida somewhere. And and the first time I, I came across his channel was because he was doing these amplifier shootouts and I was fascinated. I was thinking, wow, this is great uh, because it's been a long time since I've had the opportunity of doing amplifier shootouts other than the stuff obviously that we carry. And he was doing Griffin and Boulder and D'Agostino and on and on. I was thinking, wow, this is fantastic. And I love his passion. Um, uh, I like the fact that he, he also comes right out and says what he believes, which is wonderful, um, as opposed to a lot of times where people are more politically correct. I, I, I like the fact that he has very specific favorites and what he likes and so on. And then um, recently, uh, well, it's not recently, a little while ago, I came across another channel called um, OCD uh, OCD Mike OCD Mikey, and here's another very cool uh, cat as well. He he he, um, he he loves panels. He 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 loves a completely different kind of sound from what I can gather. They got together, and um, Mikey went to Jay's house to listen to his system and and, and gave his comments. And then recently, um, Jay went to Mikey's house. This is very recent, and gave his comments. And what's fascinating is that from what I gather, and I can be wrong, so so if, if uh, Jay and Mike, if you're watching this, I apologize if I got it wrong. Mikey seemed to, or Mike, seemed to sort of struggle to say that he, it, it didn't occur to me that he particularly liked Jay's system. Jay went to Mike's uh, house 
and seemed to be blown away by how smooth everything seemed to be and had the speakers disappeared and so on and so forth. And I thought, this is fascinating because it reminded me so much about my own journey through uh, this this crazy industry of ours. So I thought, well, let's do let's do this, yeah, uh, audiophile versus music lover, uh, or both. Is there a, a way that we can find common ground between the two? Um, so um, before I throw it over to Philip. Let me just uh, mention a couple of uh, one question that I'd like you guys who are watching to answer. Um, is it sufficient or enough if the playback is emotionally engaging, but from an audiophile's perspective, it's lacking? In other words, you're listening to music and it, it moves you, you're, you're, you're engaged, you're really enjoying the music. But then if you were to turn on your critical perspective and say, there's no imaging, the sound is blah image you know the, the 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 there's no depth there's no you know real details and separation all this kind of stuff is that enough for you guys or conversely is it sufficient if you get great audiophile qualities right you have incredible separation you have the speakers completely disappear you can hear every single detail like for example a fart you know that the musician happened to to let one out you know seven eight rows back uh, from the microphone and yet, musically, it's it's kind of dry. Um, how do how do you feel about that? Um, is that enough? Um, so, Philip, take it away. What do you think? Um, <clears throat> how do I say this nicely? <laughs> Why stop now? You've never said anything nicely. Um, I mean, I'm an audiophile. You are. I can, just like you, hear all the, the various different attributes. Yeah. Um, but <clears throat> Wait a what minute. Can, can, can you qualify yourself as an audiophile if you like JBL? I, I, I want to know from the other two guys. See, they, they, they shake they their know? heads. Uh, they what do they heads. know? Their combined ages isn't enough to... <laughs> That's true. <laughs> not, not even half your Did age. They never even heard them. Yeah. Anyway, so, go ahead. Sorry. I, I I've listened stop. to all the JBLs. Yeah, I should stop. Except the new stuff, which sucks. Oh, he actually agrees with me. Anyway. No, the new stuff is not the JBL of the past. Um, you know, a lot of the vintage stuff were actually the the most, you know, thought out, the mo the ultimate uh, transducers of their time. And, and <clears throat> just just for those of you who think that I'm slagging JBL, Philip knows I tease him. It's it's I, it's not true. I actually quite like some of the early studio monitors, the forty, the four thousand series, um, and so on. Um, I just like to uh, you know poke at him because he lives in like a little shoebox of a of a living room, and he's got ginormous speakers that take up the wall. Well, my whole system takes up a wall if I ever get to install it, <clears throat> and I'm not using JBLs at the moment. I'm using Altex. <laughs> <laughs> I do consider myself an audiophile, uh, and only passingly, um, and only because I'm exposed to all this stuff, and I've had, I've owned a lot of it, <clears throat> um, and you know, I even broke down and bought Wilson Audio speakers, um, those Watt Puppy Sixes, which I really loved. Okay, it's kind of sad that I got rid of them, but I couldn't keep them in my new place. So it would have driven everybody in the, in the entire apartment complex to, like, be knocking at my door going, like, what the heck are you doing in there, boy? So um, they, they, were, they were disposed of uh, to, a, to a nice person out in Calgary, and he's very happy with them. <clears throat> uh, but being an audiophile pales to being a music lover. Um, I'll give you the, the simplest example I, uh, I, can, I can think of or I can feel or have experience. When I was, I have a, I have a eighties playlist that I de deliberately put together of some more of the, more of the obscure stuff. But these are the important songs that, that were formative for me when I was a younger person. And yeah, I listened to it. And if a system can play it passingly, then I know the system has some forgiveness. And I actually prefer a system that will do that, especially speakers. Um, it's very, very, very sad when you're listening to the music you love so much that's so important to you, and it's not enjoyable. So for me, 
I have to connect to the music. I've always said this. I believe that a lot of audiophiles, so-called audiophiles, will agree with me that um, if you don't connect to the music, if it doesn't mean something to you, then it's pointless. You know, it's like a it's like a time machine in a sense. It will bring you back to a point in time when something s- stupendous happened for you, whether it's sad or happy or you know. Um, in, in, in anything in between, uh, those are the important days of your life. And, you know, obviously it doesn't take much to, to get me going. Um, I've, I've started bawling my eyes out in the car listening to OMD because it reminded me of, you know, a very sad moment at that time. And, um, and every time I listen to the same song, I'm transported back to that moment. It doesn't need to be audiophile to do that. I don't need to hear every little tiny placement. I don't need to hear all these extra little things. Those are interesting. But the core of the music is in the vocal performance, in the um, musicianship, in the actual brilliance of what you think of the composition. You know, the way the harmonic structures work. Etc. Etc. It's all evocative, and if it doesn't, if it doesn't bring something extra out of you, then what's the point of it? Philip, let me ask you a question because I've never asked you this before. Was there ever a period when you first got into this seriously? Was there ever a time where you started chasing the audiophile aspect um, without knowing that you were doing so, or or chasing it unconsciously? Uh, at the expense of musicality? No, I've always chased musicality. Okay. So when I first started getting into vintage audio and single-ended amplification, it was to achieve this kind of transcendent joy, just the joy of listening and to hear music in a context that is beyond your normal kind of experience. And for me... Vintage stuff still kind of does that. Um, certainly tube amplification definitely does that, whether it's just the preamp or, you know, a power amp or any of the sources. Like Cayenne has a relatively inexpensive um, CD player, and it's got tubes in the, um, uh, the DAC portion of it. It's a very interesting piece. I like it not so much because it's way better than, you know, are the other things that we have, uh, uh, um, you know, access to. I like it because it's kind of tubey, and I don't mind the fact that there's a little bit of coloration in there, but in a, in a sort of pleasant way, um, uh, it's easy to listen to. I think that's really important. I think we as audiophiles lose sight of that. Um, there's something as there's something that is too much. I think there's definitely something that's too much. When you listen, when the reason I really disliked. Wilson, the Wilson Audio Watt Puppy 5.1s, which I heard at American Sound way back in the day. And I know other other uh, people who have heard the speaker will remark the same thing. And it was just too, too much all forward edge, ultra, ultra detail. Everything was just etched. And yes, the imaging was unbelievable. And you're sitting there, you go like, that's coming out of that little box. The box totally disappeared. But there was no soul to the music. There's no, you know, human quality to it. It could have been made by, and it was made by a machine, in a sense, right? Um, there's a difference between what is to be alive and what is not to be alive. And I believe music should be alive. I mean, that's why we love going to any kind of live recording. Like when you go to a live venue, listen to a band, and, you know, uh, there's a difference. There's a connect connection between you standing there or sitting there in the audience and, 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 and being totally involved with the performance that is on stage. Um, we try to get close to that with the equipment that we buy, but it really doesn't, it really doesn't do that, and you have to acknowledge it. I mean, there are people who chase that too. Um, I think both can exist in the same space. So you can love both instances. On the one hand, you can go to a, a concert, and that's a super great experience. On the other hand, you can listen to your system at home, and it doesn't have to be live recordings. It could just be you know normal, put together recordings in the studio, and it can give you 
a similar end result not experience the because the experiences are different each is each experience is equally um, valid and um, you should cherish each for its own attributes so Philip never had the experience that I went through um, when I first discovered audio as a passion it wasn't because of the music I was stunned that I could hear stuff I never thought I, I never heard of before. So, for example, um, I walked into um, what was that store no, on not, Queen Street? That's what was not. that store on Queen Street? Um, Ring Audio. And so, um, I, I I've told the story before. I bought these Bose nine hundred ones because Stereo Review had said they were essentially the best speakers ever. Bought them and they sucked, and I couldn't understand why. They they sounded horrible. There was no highs, no bass. Everything sounded very compressed, and I thought the speakers were broken. <clears throat> I was very disillusioned. I walked into this store called Ring Audio on, in, in Toronto back then, and they played me these tiny little speakers, which I found out later were the LS35As, the Rogers, with a little musical fidelity A1, which, by the way, I have in my office. I've uh, been refurbished, never turned it on since. Pure Class A, 20 watts per channel. And a Rega Planar 3 turntable, the original Rega 3, and it played music. But more than that, it wasn't just the music. I, 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 I was blown away by these tiny little speakers, how they disappeared. And suddenly you had the sound that, that came from outside of the boxes and this depth and so on. And that was the, my, uh, um, my first realization that you could have this kind of experience. And then I started chasing that like crazy. Then I was told about magazines like The Absolute Sound and Stereophile, and I would read them religiously. Then I found a store called High End Audio, and the first time I heard a pair of uh, Martin Logan CLSs. Now, that was in many ways um, the, 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 the critical turning event, if you will. These speakers also did the disappearing act, but they were so transparent. You, you heard things that floated between the panels and the speed and articulation, stuff that I'd never heard before. And I started chasing that. I became, in the truest sense, an audiophile. I started listening to stuff that, that people told me you would hear. And then sure enough, I would hear it. Harry Pearson would say, yeah, if you listen to Cantati Domino, you know, the I think the eight or ninth second, you hear this door close. And I would, oh, wow, there it is. And then on other systems, you could barely hear it. Yeah, you could hear chairs creaking. I remember when Don Morrison came to visit me when we first had the store uh, on Brimley. And, and he brought this, uh, I think it was Shostakovich. Uh, album that he had and y you could hear the conductor I wish I could remember to this day I've forgotten now uh, um, and he whispers very quietly in, in, in the movement um, says now and you hear this and then you play you play the same album on, on something else and you wouldn't hear it as much and and so I, I was completely uh, turned on by this and so like Philip in his early days I started buying as much as I could, trading, trying different things. Reminds me of what Jay went through, right, in the early days when he was working here. I was constantly trying Yeah, every week things. he had something different. Yeah, I was constantly, within the very limited budget that I had, constantly bartering, begging, trying different things, and chasing the ultimate of audiophilia. And after a while, maybe about three, four years into it, I started realizing I was extremely unhappy. I wasn't enjoying my music anymore. And in fact, what, what catalyzed everything was my older brother David came to visit in, uh, in Toronto and I showed him my system. At the time it was, um, uh, I, I still had the pair of LS35As among other things and it had just been hooked up and I had the Audible Illusions preamplifier with a, I think it was the Counterpoint SA20 amplifier hooked up to it and a, a VPI HW19 with the Eminent Technology a torn arm and a um, Koetsu black cartridge. And I played Dire Straits. I played Air on G string. I played a whole bunch of stuff for him. And I said, listen to how the speakers disappear. Listen to how the voice is right in the middle and so on and so forth. And he sat there very attentively. And then he said, um, do you have Pavarotti uh, uh, doing Nessun Dorma, the 1972? And sure enough, of course, I mean, that is a seminal record, and, and I hadn't played it for a very long time, so I put it on, and my jaw dropped. It sucked. It couldn't handle Pavarotti at his peak, 
right at the very, very end when he hits high B. I mean, the speakers sounded like they were about to break. And I wasn't playing very loud. just couldn't handle the dynamics. You could hear the distortion. It was terrible. And then he said, uh, how about Von Karajan's uh, 1962 or 63 Beethoven cycle? 63? Yeah. And so we both love number six. So we put a number six, listen to the whole thing. Um, the storm. It's, it, it was terrible. There was no dynamics. Everything was compressed. And, I, and then he left. And, and I started rethinking my whole approach. I started thinking, this is terrible. This is music that I love. But this system cannot reproduce this music properly the way that I thought it should. All I could think of was that this system sounded bad with these this, these two pieces well, of music. I mean, quite frankly, LS35A can't produce scale. Right. But but the point was, then I started, after he left, put on the other speakers I had in my system. Like you, I thought about that. And and the thing was, when I played music that I cared about, it wasn't audio file recordings, you know, none of the Sheffield Labs and so on. Just music that I cared about, I couldn't enjoy it. Um, and then I started realizing when, when I had this store, I started the store. I started really hating the the music that was well recorded, that the music that I liked, the the dire straits and so on, because everybody played the same piece over and over again, and it took me a long time, literally about two years or so, of completely turning off the critical faculties, and just to be able to start enjoying music again. Um, took that that long to untrain myself to be critical. So anyway, that was my journey uh, as to coming back to uh, being a music lover first and then still now being able to enjoy it as an audiophile. So that's my journey. I guess the, the conclusion for me, the takeaway, is that for me today, I would much, much, much rather be a music lover first and an audiophile second. I think that's why... Uh, both Philip and I really, really like what we carry. It's not because we think that's the best thing in the world. I don't know if there's such a thing. But I certainly do know this. There aren't a lot of other products out there that can consistently give us the musical enjoyment, um, among other things, reliability, that you can buy uh, regularly, uh, relatively affordably, and so on, uh, uh, than the products that we represent, versus stuff that strictly... Uh, audiophile base. We, we, we actually try to stay away from those kinds of products. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, definitely. I mean, there is there is a sound that we have. The, most of the equipment that we ha bring to the store um, will give us some semblance of that sonic signature. There is a sonic signature that we like and that we, that we um, promote. Um, it's certainly about you know, slightly a bit more relaxed if possible, not forward, not bright. I have had lots of people come in here, and when I mention those kinds of words and phrases, they're in total agreement. This is what they're searching for. Um, that's not easy to find. Yeah. Actually, it's not easy to find because audiophile, uh, the audiophile way is not that way. It's about hearing every last little tiny thing. I don't give a damn. I'm sorry, I, do, I just don't. It's all about listening to music that I really enjoy. And if it has, if it's well recorded, bonus. Um, but on, I have a track on my playlist. It's Dwayne Eddy. It's really badly recorded, but it has certain sonic characteristics that's quite interesting. And the performance is um, spectacular. I mean, it's it's really amazing. It's, it's totally gut wrenching so that's on my playlist but it's it's actually as a, an example of poorly recorded stuff but it still has that ability to grab you yeah so so, so i laugh at Philip's banana rama he laughs at my john denver so we're we're sort of well you know, also like dan fogelberg so. i do how can you not like dan fogelberg one of ultra the best, smooth voice one of the best poets of all time um let's conclude real quick um um there was a point here that I wrote down. Um, we, I had a whole list of pros and cons, but I think we've covered most of it. Um, yeah, so this was, this was my last takeaway as far as um, wrapping it up. 
the one thing I've always admired about Villip is that if you watch his uh, his feedback in all of the videos we've done so far, he always stresses about if he really likes something, you know, because it it he connects with the device or that speaker or the amplifier, whatever it is, he connects with it emotionally. He always talks about that, about how it makes him feel. Um, and then on my end of it, I try to balance out the video by talking about the audiophile qualities because I know that we don't just uh, have viewers who are uh, strictly music lovers. We also have viewers who are interested in what about the sonic aspects of it. So I, I tend to balance it out by throwing those kinds of um, uh, things into the video. So that's what we do in our videos, uh, for better or for worse. And uh, I thank you if you've uh, watched this to this end. Um, Angus was, I uh, know, Alex was just telling me that our average view time went from six to ten minutes. <laughs> six to ten minutes. My gosh, we do our videos at 30 or 35 minutes and we get uh, most of you guys leaving after six minutes. That's funny. Um, but anyway, if you've watched it to this end, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Because as as most of you know, or many of you know, the money we get, we match it and we donate to uh, the Salvation Army. So thank you very much. So any last words, Philip? Angus? Alex? No? Okay. Uh, thank you for watching. Adrian from Audio Accents Canada. Philip, Angus, Alex. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs>